what a pleasure it is to be able to speak to you today um, on behalf of people who live with type 1 diabetes. And as you will discover, this has sort of been my passion and intense life journey to help them. And low carb really appears to have a major role. Um, by way of disclosure, I will just first say that I've been a consultant for Lexicon Pharma for a drug that alters carbohydrate metabolism for Verta Health, for No Foods, and also for Sanofi Aventis as they commercialize this drug that alters carbohydrate metabolism. Um, I want to talk to you about type 1 diabetes. And for a pediatrician such as myself, this was really the prototypic, feared, awful thing that could happen. So let's just imagine. In 1915, a pediatrician such as myself would have a mother bring a child into the clinic, and the child would be wasting away. And essentially, there was no therapy available. And the primary therapy was a diet that emphasized fat as the major macronutrient. And you could extend, this is a so-called Allen diet, and you could extend the lifespan of people from a few months to a few years. But essentially, they would eventually waste away. Um, and with the discovery of insulin, children were able to live remarkably, wonderfully. And Banting and Bess won the Nobel Prize for this. And there were uh, ticker tape parades. And it was considered, at the time, a cure for type 1 diabetes. Really an amazing thing. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary of this discovery. But was insulin really a cure for type 1? Um, unfortunately, the answer turns out to be no. And so in the initial years following the discovery of insulin, this is, this is a clinic series from the Joslin in Boston, what you see is in the decades following the discovery of insulin, people began to um, be diagnosed with very serious complications of diabetes. And these are the ones that we all know and fear. And they include, um, as you can see here, calcified arteries and retinitis proliferans. That's, that's diabetic retinopathy, high blood pressure and proteinuria, diabetic kidney disease. And uh, it was quite serious. And moreover, these complications would ultimately result in altered survival. So insulin-treated type 1 diabetes patients had very high rates of mortality even into the 1990s. So I'm 52, and I was born in 1965. I don't have type 1 diabetes. But if I did, I would have been in this uh, cohort that was approximately the, the second cohort. And you can see, fast forward into my virtual diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, about a third of my peers would have expired from this. Really a serious problem. OK, so what could we do about this? And um, anybody who thinks about type 1 diabetes has to understand the diabetes control complication trial, which really ushered in the modern era for type 1 diabetes care. It's a very simple, uh, shockingly beautiful clinical trial. And what they did was they just asked, if you got people's blood sugar better, would they end up doing better? And so they got 1,441 patients type 1 diabetes of only a few years duration. And they randomized them to either intensive therapy or conventional therapy. And the idea was to reduce their, their blood glucose. And they measured this with uh, hemo uh, glycated hemoglobin, which is a precursor of what we now know as hemoglobin A1c. And you can see that the cohort that got this intensive therapy had much lower blood glucoses. It was intended to be a 10-year trial. But there's a safety and monitoring board that's following the trial. And they see that there are these huge differences in between the curves in the primary outcome measure, which is microvascular complications, retinopathy, eye disease, and nephropathy, kidney disease. And they said, we have to stop the trial. So they stopped the trial. At, at the American Diabetes Association scientific sessions, they held press conferences. There was a big talk. And what happened? Well, again, you can see this amazing paper in the New England Journal that describes the immense difference in microvascular complications in between those who had this intensive therapy and those who had conventional therapy. What was intensive therapy? At the time, they basically just tried to figure it out. There really were no standards. It was an early form of, of uh, crowdsourcing. So there were mandatory conference calls, and they told each center to basically share their best practices. And, uh, and in some cases, people were very intensely followed. On average, people were contacted by phone call or face-to-face -face way more than once a month. Okay, 
And the, the cute part about this trial is it's now been 30 years. So we can follow this cohort and see what happens. And um, the follow-up study has been incredibly informative. And uh, what you see is that the conventional arm, they began to have essentially slightly better uh, outcomes. So they learned the benefits of intensive therapy and they started uh, managing their diabetes more aggressively, more, more injections per day, trying to get their blood sugars closer to normal. The people who were in the intensive arm, well, they lost the support that they had been provided by the NIH. They, and as a result, they went from an average glycated hemoglobin around 7.4 up to around 8. And that's where they've remained. But the really amazing part is that the effects of intensive diabetes control have lasted to this day. And so, and, and so there's one, this is EDIC, and essentially this is the cardiovascular outcomes. And what you see is decreased cardiovascular disease with intensive type 1 diabetes treatment. That's really exciting because it says that everything that we do to support people who live with type 1 can have huge effects on their overall health. And it's not just cardiovascular disease, it's actually also survival. So wonderful, right? And, and it really puts the pressure on us to come up with a better way to treat and support these people. So millions of people have type 1 diabetes, 1.25 million Americans. And it's a big deal. So it's the most common life-threatening chronic illness of childhood in developed countries. Um, so it's a really, really sc uh, terrible scourge for, for our society. Growing in prevalence, all ethnic groups, injected insulin is the only available therapy, really, um, and a major risk of life-threatening complications. And Moreover, definitive therapies have been a long ways off. And you'll notice I didn't use that C word. I try not to use the C word. It starts with a C and it includes an R. You can fill in the vowels. But um, I would say that for us who support people with type 1 diabetes, it's really important to be grounded in the here and now. Um, and uh, our country has made a huge commitment to support these patients, as evidenced by support from the federal government in the diabetes, um, a special diabetes program. And as you can see here from this picture, even the president of the United States, our previous president, was on board with this. This is a picture that was taken on the south portico of the White House, and I was about 20 feet away with 200 kids with type 1 diabetes, and we were on a lobbying trip. So really um, an amazing fight to try to support them. So are we successful in caring for people with type 1? Generally, no. And um, this, I think, is the best data on glycemic outcomes for people with type 1 diabetes. And you can see the vast majority of people who live with type 1 diabetes are not able to achieve the ADA recommended targets, which is less than 7.5 for children and less than 7.0 HbA1c for adults. People just can't do it. It's too hard. Um, and are there adverse consequences even if you do achieve your glycemic targets? There's a New England Journal article. It's pretty amazing. I don't, I, I don't really like to talk about negative stuff. I'm a relentlessly positive person. But this paper shows something very disturbing, and I want to highlight it for you. In patients with type 1 diabetes who are able to achieve outstanding glycemic control, hemoglobin A1Cs less than 7, they still have... Um, a, a risk of cardiovascular death that is 2.92 fold the general population. And death from any cause is 2.36. So that's scary, and it says we need to do better. And there's huge unmet need for this population. Okay, so parents always ask me this. When will basic science knowledge translate to improve type 1 diabetes outcomes? And what I tell them is it's a long and winding road, and I don't really know. And there's a bunch of potential ways that we could support and help people, and they include medicines for, that might affect beta cell regeneration of the cells that have been lost, stem cell therapies, or immunotherapies, poisoning the immune system to get it to sort of redirect itself and not destroy the beta cells. You'd still have to regrow the beta cells somehow. Or advanced technologies, like an automated insulin delivery system. And as it turns out, it's just too complicated to have automated insulin delivery with a single hormone because we consume very large amounts of carbohydrates. And by the time the blood glucose goes up and the insulin goes in, there's just too much of a, of a temporal delay. And so you end up swerving back and forth in glucoses. Very unsuccessful. Um, my interest 
in low carb essentially came from a paper, and I'm not really gonna talk about the paper, but we made a discovery uh, starting about 10 years ago that people with type 1 diabetes have minimal attempt at beta cell regeneration. So within their pancreas, if you look at cell cycle entry and you're asking, is there any attempt to make new beta cells? You find no. So I was shocked by this, and it said to me that my role as a basic scientist might, at least in my lifetime, never translate to improved outcomes for people with type 1. And so I had to ask, what else could I do to try to affect change to support these people? So I want to talk to you about this idea of carbohydrate metabolism in type 1 and, um, and get into the pathophysiology. Insulin secretion by, uh, by the beta cells really at the center of glucose homeostasis, as you know, and the, and, and the islets make insulin, which act upon skeletal muscle and also act upon uh, liver to suppress uh, hepatic gluconeogenesis and also act upon fat to, to drive glucose into fat to support adipogenesis. And this is sort of how it's supposed to work in the normal state. But in type 1 diabetes, things are a little more complicated because you've lost your beta cells. You have a few beta cells, if any at all. You try to replace the beta cells with injected insulin. It's an incredibly crude and wildly difficult thing to do. And then let's imagine you are told to eat something like this. <laughs> so what is this? <laughs> Snack wells, cookies, fat-free, <laughs> devil's food. <laughs> so what happens here? So with snack wells, cookies, you drive your glucose up very high. And as a result, you need a whole bunch of insulin because you're consuming a lot of carbohydrate. And then you're driving a huge amount of insulin ultimately to, to suppress hepatic gluconeogenesis and a huge amount of insulin to, uh, to the fat and people who consume a lot of carbohydrates end up gaining a lot of weight in type 1 diabetes, and it's been a major problem. And actually, the cohort in the diabetes control complication trial that gained the most weight had the worst cardiovascular outcomes, essentially equivalent to the control arm. So they lost the benefits of intensive control by, in, by ending up in the cohort that gained too much weight. Okay, so we'll get away from the devil's food. But I do think it's important to talk about, about carbohydrate metabolism in type 1 because people are asked to consume a lot of carbohydrates. In this room, people might think, oh, it's, it's obvious. If you can't make insulin, you should just try to consume less carbohydrates. But this is a handout from a children's hospital. And as you can see, it says caring for your child's health, recommended carbohydrate amount per age of child. And you'll see that if you have a male, 14 to 18 years of age, new onset type 1 diabetes, you're told to feed that, that uh, teenage boy 120 grams of carbohydrates for dinner, plus other stuff. So what does that do? Well, if you look at the glycemic excursions of somebody who consumes a, a lot of carbohydrate, and this is from a continuous glucose monitor that is reading interstitial fluid, uh, measuring glucose, you see wild variations, a huge roller coaster. And imagine yourself on this roller coaster. You have, a, you have a double down arrow on your continuous glucose monitor, and you know that you're basically going to bottom out. And I, I can't overestimate the impact on people's lives having to worry about their glucose and the variability. It's really quite debilitating. So does macronutrient content influence type 1 diabetes outcomes? Well, I, I would argue maybe. And we need to figure this out. But a, a more fundamental question I've been asking is, what are we eating? And what shapes mac macronutrient content of the foods we eat? And if you go to the American Diabetes Association, this is from 2014, you see the standards of medical care, quotes the Institute of Medicine report in the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, the AMDRs, for, um, uh, which tell you how much carbs and fat and protein to consume. And this essentially is law. So what is this AMDR? So this is the dietary reference intakes that was the product of a work group from the Institute of Medicine, now, now which is called the National Academies of, of, of Medicine. And they got a bunch of very smart people together to look at different macronutrients to ask, 
what should we be eating? And I, um, I read this, I thought it was amazing, really uh, remarkably lucid for a document that uh, ended up shaping our nutritional uh, advice. Anybody in the room read this? Raise your hand. A few. It's 500 yeah, 500 pages. It's ridiculous. It's, ridiculous. it's actually written by some incredibly smart people and it's filled with, with stuff that'll blow your mind. It's free, it's available online, and, and I would not dismiss it by any means. But what happens in, in, in the DRI? Well, they're trying to describe the balance in between carbohydrates and fat in dietary intake. And what they say is if you eat too many carbohydrates, you're gonna have a decrease in HDL, you're gonna have more triglycerides, you're gonna have uh, more LDL particles, and ultimately you're gonna increase your cardiovascular risk. But they say, in contrast, if you eat a lot of fat, you're going to have more dietary energy, you're gonna gain weight, you're gonna have more saturated fat, and you're gonna have more cardiovascular risk. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that's the argument that's made in the document that shapes what we eat. And essentially, this is the, this is the advice that comes down uh, on, on, the, on the Ten Commandments. And and what they say is that if you find a balance in between these two different extremes, you can essentially keep your cardiovascular risk to a minimum. So essentially what they're saying is you've got to find a healthy balance in between two extremes of too many carbs or too much fat. So um, as a friend of mine said, he goes, you mean it's sort of like they're choosing in between black and white, and so they chose 18% gray? <laughs> I'm like, yes. And what the problem with the AMDR is it had lookup tables in the back, which describe, summarize the 500 pages. And so if the AMDR is 500 pages long, no one reads it. They just go to the lookup tables and they assume that the lookup tables represent all that's contained within. And by the way, the AMDR states explicitly that it does not apply to disease states and yet it is enforced for disease states like type 1 diabetes around the world. We're enslaved by this document. Okay, so I, you guys already know this. Do dietary fats in, influence human health? Well, there's a lot of very lively debate. And I, I read this paper, which was this meta-analysis on saturated fat and total fat, and was really amazed to, dis to discover that saturated fat was not an, associated with increased death, and moreover, uh, whereas trans fats are probably evil, uh, and industrial trans fats especially, ruminant trans fats appear to be neutral, and, and moreover, may actually protect from type 2 diabetes. So that's pretty amazing, and that goes counter to what the American Diabetes Association is saying. I want to get to insulin as well. So um, I showed you that people with type 1 diabetes struggle and they have adverse uh, cardiovascular outcomes. I've wondered whether too much insulin, because of the artificial way it's delivered, could be placing people at risk. And if you go to model organisms, uh, especially this one, the roundworm, what you see is that too much insulin signaling is quite toxic. And when you introduce a mutation where you block insulin signaling partially, the worms live twice as long. So there's a brilliant paper by Cynthia Kenyon, who's now um, at Google, used to be at Howard Hughes and UCSF, and it shows that re selectively reducing some of your insulin action in your body can be incredibly beneficial, at least if you're a roundworm. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens if you increase uh, insulin signaling in people with type 2 diabetes? So what if you just jack up the insulin action? And there's this uh, amazing paper, it's called Accord, where they had this idea they were gonna do the DCCT for type two diabetes. They're gonna get everybody's blood sugar to near normal. So what did they do? They told them to take much more insulin. They aggressively supported them. They got way lower blood sugars. Their hemoglobin A1C is around six and a half. And as a result, they had more cardiovascular death. The intensively treated arm had worse outcomes. How about if you do the opposite? What if you decrease insulin signaling people with type one diabetes? Well, there are these really interesting drugs that are now coming online and IMPA Impagliflozin is one of the sort of prototypic, and this does multiple things. It actually increases glucagon and may also increase circulating ketones, but you can see that there's far less cardiovascular death. 
It's an amazing finding, about 42% less death by taking IMPA. And it suggests that altering uh, uh, carbohydrate or, or macronutrient substrates can, can really benefit some diabetes patients, either through this or through innovative nutritional interventions. So how about innovative dietary interventions for, um, for, for treatment of type 1 diabetes? Well, Dr. Richard Bernstein has been a pioneer in this, and he's been working on innovative uh, nutrition for type 1 diabetes for decades. And he went to medical school after he discovered that keeping his blood sugar very close to normal made him feel far better. He avoids refined carbohydrates. And he has a whole book about it, and it's really a terrific book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, it's considered toxic by the traditional pediatric endocrine or adult endocrine people. Um, I heard recently one person even referred to him as a quack, which I think is really terrible because this is a guy who's devoted his life to supporting people with diabetes and has really innovated in remarkable ways. So what do you eat if you're on a diet like this? Well, the, you can eat some meat and some, and some fat and some vegetables. This is a picture taken by my friend Marshall, um, who's, a, who's a young man who has type 1 diabetes. He's in his uh, early 30s. He eats um, a very uh, exciting and rich and varied diet, and he feels great. And as you can see, most of his calories are coming from fat, and his glucose control if he's really careful, is spectacular. Just amazing. And Marshall called me up and he said, Jake, you know, for most of my life, I thought I was going to die from type 1 diabetes. And he said, now I actually think there's a chance that I could live. And I just thought, wow, you know, like, we got to figure this out. It's so cool. So I showed you this glucose tracing from an 18 year old who's had type 1 diabetes for around 10 years. And look what happens on, a, uh, on low carb. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It's just amazing. <laughs> Here's another set of tracings. Here's a 23-year-old with type 1 diabetes for 12 years. And um, this is a high carb day. And actually, this is a typo. This is the low carb day. But you can see this immediately. I'll just flip back and forth. The glucose excursions are minimal. So that's really cool. So we're on to something It's very exciting. Um, here's another one. And this is very curious. So this is a 22-year-old who's had type 1 diabetes for one year. He's low carb since diagnosis. This is somebody who came to see me basically on the down low because I'm a pediatrician and not supposed to care for, <laughs> for adults. <laughs> and, and he knew that I was, he somehow had found out that I was the, 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 the low carb aficionado. He's been on, on, on low carb since diagnosis. And I want to just ask a really provocative question. He's on minimal doses of insulin. Does low carb, high fat preserve type 1 diabetes beta cell function? Um, it appears so. And the question is, is it permanent? Or are we merely delaying or forestalling the destruction of beta cells? Um, I don't know. We have to answer these questions. We've got to try to figure this out. OK. Does low-carb, high-fat synergize with automated insulin delivery? I want to tell you about an open-source patient movement, um, which is called um, Open APS. And it's part of something else, which you may have heard of, called We Are Not Waiting. And these are people who live with type 1 or have loved ones with type 1 who are trying to get data out there so that they can act upon it. And in this case, Dana Lewis and her husband were able to essentially hack their insulin pump. They got the glucose monitor hooked up to the insulin pump, and they wrote code. And, and that is now out there. And, um, and they have published the code, and people are able to implement the code on their own to have automated insulin delivery. But of course, a big problem with automated insulin delivery is you have very large glycemic excursions. Because if you're consuming carbohydrates, it's like you're sort of driving a car, and you're holding the steering wheel from way, way back, but you can't quite see where you're going. So by the time you make a change, it's too late, and you're sort of fishtailing around the road. And you can see in the glucose um, tracings here that the blood glucoses are ranging in between 60 and 200, 
you have that roller coaster. In this case, the time scale is over just a few days. But you can certainly, so it's sort of compressed as opposed to a 24 hour time scale. But you can certainly see from afar that there's a huge number of excursions and the system is not working to essentially restore glycemia. So what happens if you add low carb to this? So again, this is, this is an experiment that was performed, self-experiment, by um, an amazing person. His name is Adrian. He calls himself Adrian LXM, and he's a developer for this project where they are hacking and creating these, uh, these open source insulin pumps. So you can see. <laughs> so it's just incredible. So let's now look into the future and let's imagine a world where everyone has access to their own healthcare data, where people understand the impact of nutrition on their type 1 diabetes, where we have tools like automated insulin delivery systems, and we can start to see how innovative, novel dietary approaches can have a transformative impact. And I, I just so want that to happen, and I think it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to be a community. It's not going to be any one of us. Okay, so would low-carb, high-fat nutrition violate ADA consensus guidelines? <laughs> well, I, every year I read the diabetes care consensus guidelines, and this year they said something kind of strange. They said studies examining the ideal amount of carbohydrate intake for people with diabetes are inconclusive, although monitoring carbohydrate intake and considering the blood glucose response are key. <laughs> Fats, this is new. They said the um, ideal amount of dietary fat for individuals with diabetes is controversial. Uh, and then they go on to quote the National Academy of Medicine, the AMDRs that we talked about before. But then they also say that the type of fats is more important than the total amount of fat, ignoring that meta-analysis that I showed you that describes how saturated fat is protective for type 2 diabetes. Um, and so overall, they say the data on the ideal total dietary fat content for people with diabetes are inconclusive, so eating a plan emphasizing elements of a Mediterranean-style diet, blah 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 <laughs> And, and, and then you see macronutrient distribution, and they give this wishy-washy statement that says almost nothing at all. It says it should be individualized. And I'm going to argue this from an optimistic perspective. I believe that this gives us license to try out low-carb nutrition in people with type 1, and it does not explicitly violate ADA guidelines. <laughs> right? Okay, so um, resources for low-carb nutrition type 1. I, I have to mention Adam Brown, who's, a, who's really um, doing a lot of terrific work. He works for uh, Close Concerns, and he wrote this book called Bright Spots and Landmines, and it's a terrific book that describes a bunch of tips on, on low-carb nutrition and general tips on health and wellness from the perspective of a young adult who's thriving despite type 1 diabetes. And it's a great book, and I just re highly recommend it uh, if you want to give it to anybody you know. Um, I want to talk about what we don't know. So we, we really, I've given you some anecdotes, but I will say explicitly that there's a lot to be learned, and we must be more aggressive in trying to carry out proper, well-controlled studies on this. So we need to understand the impact of low-carb nutrition on disease burden. How do people feel? What's their subjective experience? We need to understand its imp potential impact on somatic growth. There's been a lot of wild conjecture on somatic growth, but we need proper studies to understand. We hear great anecdotes of some kids on low carb who are doing really very well. <clears throat> Obviously, glucose control. We need to understand how to operationalize low carb high fat at scale. We need, um, and we need to ask like which low carb dietary strategy should we use? Are we talking about Mediterranean or paleo or are we talking like low carb high fat or keto or what degree of keto? And we don't have good controlled studies to be able to determine this and I would like to understand this but again there's been no funding so we just we don't have license to do it properly. We need to understand synergy with other therapies including closed loop, 
and other adjuvant therapies, the impact on hypoglycemia, really important. And of course, healthcare costs, because ultimately, if we don't reduce healthcare expenditures, no one's going to care. So we have to find a way to reduce healthcare expenditures. Um, lipid metabolism and, uh, and the impact on, on cardiovascular disease and diabetes complications, and ultimately survival. Um, why is our knowledge base so poor about low carb, high fat, and type 1 diabetes? Well, false hope around the cure. I use the C word, sorry. Um, communication barriers in between adults with type 1 diabetes and other stakeholders, including parents of children with type 1. We've essentially walled ourselves off, and we're not having an authentic, holistic conversation in between the people who live with it as adults and the kinds of educational tools that we need to provide uh, children and their parents. Uh, lack of NIH funding, this is, this, there's just nothing that's happened. Uh, lack of private funding, uh, and we, sadly, we have an impact of the carb industry on nutritional guidelines and KOLs, and many of the really heavy-duty players in this field have consulting gigs for various industrial carb manufacturers. And of course, in, incorrect assumptions. This is my favorite one. People with type 1 diabetes need the best nutrition and therefore must follow the Institute of Medicine AMDRs. And then what can we do ultimately? It's get out, unite, communicate, destigmatize, advocate for better standards. The Nutrition Coalition, please join and, and participate. Advocate for more funding and better studies. Build culture. Um, having type 1 diabetes peer volunteers in clinics so that they can speak to their own experience and ensure that the clinical care that we provide is authentic. Um, diabetes camp volunteers so that we sort of pull away the veil and we're able to show providers what it's really like to, to be around people with type 1 diabetes for multiple days. Um, apprenticeships with master clinicians, psychology collaborations, philanthropy, technology, advocacy, mentoring, stewardship, local reinforcement. And um, ultimately, it's about people. It's about, it's about community. This is a gathering of a group of parents and their children who are followers of Dr. Bernstein. And there's a Facebook group called Type 1 Grit. And we organize, uh, and I cannot recommend this Highly enough, Type 1 Grit is, is a Facebook group, it's private, and it's, com it's comprised of 2,500 people who live with Type 1 who are following low-carb approaches, some of whom have been horribly stigmatized by their providers. We had the first um, low-carb Type 1 Grit potluck uh, at, my, at my friend's house, and this is a picture of all of us there, and we're sharing food and ideas and experiences and supporting each other. And there have been multiple uh, potlucks that have happened across the country. And again, I think this idea of building community will allow us to, to ultimately change the paradigm. So that's it.